Hey there, and welcome to the Fedora Podcast, episode 27. I'm Eric, the IT Guy Hendricks, and today we are going to be interviewing a couple of folks from the Fedora community talking about the Fedora Cloud Edition. We'll talk about what is a an edition of Fedora. We'll talk about what, uh, what goes into one, and specifically, what is Fedora Cloud. But admittedly, I learned quite a bit uh, getting prepared for this episode. Um, I had, I will admit live on air that I actually had some misconceptions about what Fedora Cloud Edition was. So to help me dive into that topic, I want to bring back uh, my co-host from a few episodes ago, Mr. Joseph Gayoso. Did I get it? Yes, you got it. Hey, Nailed everyone, it. how are you? <laughs> All right, cool. I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and also joining us today is Mr. Major Hayden himself. Uh, so, Joseph, let's start with you. Why don't you just a uh, quick introduction, tell us what you do for a living and... Uh, what do you do for Fedora? And then finally, what do you do for fun? Sure. So, um, And working on Fedora is an acceptable answer. I will say that. Well, yeah, that's kind of really become the, my hobby. <laughs> oh, there's not a lot of room for, for too much more right now. But um, for a living, I work as a data analyst. Um, so it's very much outside of you know anything Fedora related, not really in the Linux or even tech tech world. Uh, but I was always interested in technology. And a couple of years back, I learned about Fedora. And I'm like, um, well, not a couple of years back. I, I'd always been interested in technology, learned about Fedora, and I thought I want <laughs> to plug in because it seemed like a cool opportunity to actually get involved behind the scenes. Um, primarily in the, within the Fedora project, I'm on the non-technical side of things. My, I'm primarily contributing through the marketing team, uh, but you can find my opinions all over the place. <laughs> and for fun right now, it's primarily just um, working on moving forward some of our marketing team initiatives and also playing around with a thinkpad that i got that is new to me but it's a it's a t460s so it's like eight years old or something but it's running great it's running kinoite and it's like everything i wanted from a chromebook without the google bits so i'm very happy with that messing around with it Love it. In fact, that's uh, that's one of the many, many episodes we have in our backlog is to talk about what Kinoite is. And uh, so stay tuned for that. We don't have that one on the uh, we don't have that on the calendar just yet, but it is in a very large backlog. And thank you to each and every one of you for adding to that backlog. Uh, we've got probably 20 some odd episodes. And uh, so that 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 list has actually been growing. We just came back from a brief summer break. It was a couple months long. Uh, life got a little lifey there with kids coming home from school, so it was it was an interesting uh, it was an interesting summer. But the last of my kids goes back to school next week. Yes, love my kids, <laughs> love going to pick them up after work. <laughs> Major, how about you? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us what you do for a living and what you do with uh, for Fedora. Yeah, or, and so, what you do for fun too. <laughs> so I got my well, Fedora is fun. I'll, I'll go with you on that one. <laughs> uh, so I got my start with Fedora back in Fedora Core two. Uh, and, you know, slowly started to figure out how I could get involved, manage some packages and things like that. And then uh, I started working for Red Hat um, and I've done a few different jobs there. My current job is really to focus on how do we make Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, the best it can possibly be in cloud um, and make it super easy when, you know, eventually someone says, hey, I, I have all these physical servers running, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux or something else. Now I want to go to the cloud. How do I do it? And so so that's a lot of what I do. Uh, for a living. So in Fedora, um, I maintain uh, too many packages. Uh, <laughs> I think that's one thing to do it already. <laughs> I try to participate uh, in the Fedora cloud group uh, as much as I can. We come up with some good ideas in there. And then uh, also I'm part of the Fedora steering committee, uh, which is, is, is really fun and also really challenging to try and figure out, you know, where where Fedora should go technically. And some some of the decisions are very easy and the other ones get very sticky and in, in, in the weeds and, you know, really trying to think about how will this affect users and, and how will it affect, you know, Fedora's longevity go, going forward. And so fun outside Fedora. Oh man. Um, I love to run. Like that's one of my hobbies, even though it's, you know, 104 uh, Fahrenheit, like 40 Celsius outside. I still like to go run um, kind of crazy. Uh, and I love doing ham radio. Like that's, that's mm, another okay. nerdy thing, which, which goes well with Fedora because you could do a lot of really fun uh, ham radio things in the computer. Gotcha. And, and uh, with Red Hat, you're on the engineering side, correct? Right. Yep. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with RHEL. Um, for those of you that don't know, I work uh, as a technical marketer, uh, aka an operations advocate on the Red Hat side. In fact, I just uh, managed to scarf in some lunch before this uh, because I was actually live 
uh, on the RHEL YouTube channel talking about Red Hat Insights uh, and managing RHEL uh, instances. So it's been a busy day for me, um, but uh, really excited to be, uh, be with you all uh, talking about Fedora and definitely glad to have the both of you here with us, uh, with me to talk about this. Um, so let's let's dive in. Let's let's give you an easy one first, Major. Uh, what? So Fedora has Fedora Linux, and that's what we usually all think about. It's usually desktop. Some people think server. Um, but Fedora has this concept of additions, spins, labs, remixes. Um, what gives? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a mixture of things, and I, and I think it's um, uh, different levels of, of maturity, I guess, as you go up through there. And when I say maturity, like operational maturity, like would we would we block a release because a particular thing doesn't build or it doesn't pass tests. Well, if it's an addition, like if workstation doesn't boot, oh, we got problems. Like we need to go back and have a look. Uh, but if there's a, a small, like specific spin where someone's just getting started developing, you know, that spin or a remix or something like that, uh, and that has an issue, then maybe we don't block on the release, but maybe we try our best to go, you know, help that group figure out like, hey, why is this not working like it should? So I think the nice thing is that it allows people to iterate and gradually move things up and become an addition, uh, which then, of course, you get a lot more attention. You can get more help. You can get integrated with um, you know, a lot of the release automation uh, uh, things that happen in Fedora. Uh, so I think it's great because you can start with something small and you can get a small community together and say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had this? Like, for example, the, the Sway maintainer said, wouldn't it be cool if we had a, a spin that would install Sway? It was super minimal. Uh, and they could get started really small and then they could start growing and growing and growing, um, you know, and eventually that that could be, um, you know, a, a full addition in itself. I think right now it's a spin, if I remember. I'll have to go check. Yeah. But it allows for that iteration and, and maturity to, to build over time. So Joseph, you, you were going to add on there a little bit? Yeah, I, I think uh, another way to look at it, too, is um, if you, you kind of have maybe like the, the reverse direction of additions being maybe the closest to uh, these are uh, specific use cases that Fedora is targeting. So if you think of uh, workstation, server, cloud, IoT, they're kind of um, separate categories in a certain way. And then the spins are maybe different versions of those additions, if you want to think of it that way. So you have the KDE spin, the XFCE spin, our spins of, of workstation. The other ones, as far as I know, don't really have spins. It's primarily because it's it's primarily you're spinning it off so you could put a different desktop environment. Um, then with the labs, those are kind of use case specific, but a little more niche. So I think if I remember correctly, um, the neuroscience group that we have, I think they have their own lab. So that's different. I think there's a gaming lab and a security lab that um, try to do a, a little bit more. That's uh, and, and, and I think even a music oriented one. I think it's like the jam lab or something like that. Uh, where it is for a specific use case, but it's not as as broad as for like all the different ways you can use a computer. And it's more about setting up Fedora for a particular thing. And then the last one, uh, which I really wanted to mention of, of a remix is, I guess my understanding is this is almost like a temporary space, right? Because the most recent and really the only entrant that I know for this category is the recently announced Fedora Asahi remix. So this is one where at least the way that they're using it is this is their way of existing among the Fedora variants, but really the long-term goal is everything's fully upstreamed and you're not really getting as much utilization out of that. I, I don't know, uh, Major, is that, am I kind of accurate there, at least for when it comes to the remixes? Yeah, yeah, that's an area where I don't have a lot of experience, but but your summary uh, sounds accurate to me. Yeah, and it's and like I said, it's a great place for people to come and experiment. Um, you sure. know, especially yeah. like the Asahi folks saying, hey, let's try and put these things together and see if they work. Um, and it sounds like they've had a lot of success so far. Yeah, that's true. Before of... going in, I, I will say, yeah, if you have anything related to Fedora, there's always, we'll find a space for you. We'll make new cat. It doesn't matter. We'll, we'll find a space for, for Fedora because I, I, that's something I, I really enjoy is <laughs> if someone has interest in doing something, we find a space for it. So if you have an idea, just bring that over and we'll see how we can support you. So, so much like a, a paid for product has different levels of support. Like you can buy self support, standard, premium. You know, thinking to rel um, in sort of an unofficial capacity uh, in a community lens. Uh, these different um, these different versions of Fedora Linux have 
choose my words carefully here. Um, don't want the community coming after me. Uh, the, these different Fedora Linux types have different levels of support and resources available. Um, so the the closer you get to the the basic um, like workstation, like server, the more resources are going to be available, the more critical those are to releasing a version uh, into production or into general consumption. Okay. Um, those of you listening to the audio version, they're nodding their heads. Yes. So apparently I, under <laughs> I understood yes. that well. So, um, but yeah, if you didn't know, we actually have a video version that is live on YouTube every, every other Tuesday. And then uh, usually the following morning we get the audio version released. So if you're on one or the other and would prefer the other, you know, that's available there. Um, so, <clears throat> so that brings us to the crux of the conversation today. And that's the Fedora cloud edition. Now, Having been a systems administrator, I'd spent a lot of years managing Linux systems, and usually I think RHEL, I think server. But I think Fedora, my initial reaction is not Fedora server, but Fedora workstation. And when we, when we decided to do this episode, I, I admitted straight off the top that I was actually wrong about what I thought Fedora Cloud Edition was. I thought it was more of a cloud-optimized version of Fedora server. But in fact, that's not entirely accurate. So I, I will let you guys duke it out as to who answers first. But we, we talked about what an edition is. So what is Fedora Cloud Edition specifically? Uh, Joseph, you want to start? No, no, I, I'm the marketing guy. I'm here to ask oh. questions. <laughs> I mean, I've All done right, a little cool. bit of research as far as I know. But yeah, you, you, you go ahead and I, I'll answer. I'll ask questions where I don't know. <laughs> so I think the, the best way to explain it is that it's, it's Fedora served up a different way. So for example, when you do Fedora workstation, you're going to expect I'm going to have a graphical interface. I'm, I'm going to have a web browser. I'm probably going to have a text editor of some sort. And really the goal is, is that you have a use case in front of you where someone wants to be able to connect a mouse and a keyboard to the machine and go build stuff and click and, and get things done. Um, and then when you look at a server, uh, the idea is that you want to deliver everything that someone would need to put Fedora on, you know, a small, you know, small form factor machine, all the way up to maybe a 4U Dell HP type of large server. Um, so then you're thinking about, okay, well, someone doesn't want the graphical interface. Um, they're going to want to make sure that they have all the, uh, sorry, I got an excited dog in the other room. Uh, they're really going to be interested in having everything that a server would have. So maybe web interface management uh, remotely, Maybe you want to have some type of, uh, you know, uh, CPU error exception checking, um, you know, all these different things you want to have. And so cloud takes this to another level. So cloud almost takes the server mindset and then shrinks it down and says, hey, what would need to be the smallest set of things that we should put into a Fedora deployment that goes into cloud? So, for example, in cloud, you're not going to need a floppy drive or a CD drive or a kernel with all the <laughs> modules, let's say. You're, you might not need all those modules. Um, and then you wouldn't necessarily want to put a whole bunch of packages on there. So for example, um, the cloud deployment has VI for an editor, but no Vim. And the reason for that is to shrink it down. So if you're deploying a cloud instance, uh, you may not need Vim right off the bat. Now, of course, you can install it immediately with DNF and have it. But the idea there with cloud is to have this be a building block for something bigger. Um, and so that's where you get into the idea of thinking the, some people have heard the pets versus cattle analogy. Mm -hmm. You have some people that launch a VM at AWS or DigitalOcean or Linode or wherever you launch, and they take care of it as if it's a pet. If something goes wrong with it, they they fix it, they make backups of it to make sure they don't lose it. Uh, but then there's other people that do really broad deployments. Um, and their understanding is, is I'm going to deploy 10 of this type of machine, maybe a load balancer or a database or something like that. And if I lose one or two, I don't care. I'll just put a couple more in its place and I'll be good to go. Um, so for people who are thinking in that mindset, we're really trying to build Fedora Cloud for them. So keep it as small as possible. Uh, make it as something that they can use as a building block uh, for something else, but yet also connect them with everything that Fedora has. So if you want to turn it into a workstation, you could turn it into a workstation. You want to turn it into a full-fledged server with you know, remote uh, management over the web, you can do that too. There's tons of options available. Ho hopefully that helps explain some of it. So the question that comes to my mind is why not use a tool like Image Builder 
to uh, to build out a minimal server image that you would then deploy on the cloud. Or say, to the same to the same point, why would I not just use Image Builder to build a workstation image? How how does how does that approach uh, differ from using Fedora Cloud? So uh, the great thing about it is is uh, specifically with Image Builder. Um, and if you're not familiar with Image Builder, uh, it uh, uh, it consists of a few different pieces of software that together will go and not only build an image for you with with the exact packages that you need inside. Uh, but it will also package it up for you to upload directly into your favorite cloud. And depending on the cloud that you're going into, it will actually upload it and import it for you. So if you're going to AWS or Google or uh, Azure or Oracle Cloud, and I think there's one more I'm forgetting, uh, it will automatically uh, upload. Al Alibaba, I think. Yeah, it'll automatically ship it to the cloud. And so you'll just specify what you want and say, hey, go put it in AWS and then just wait, you know, maybe... 10, 15 minutes, and it'll be there, depending on your upload speed, of course. Um, but yeah, so, so you have a few options. You could take the off-the-shelf Fedora cloud image that you get on you know, getfedora.org uh, and then upload it to your favorite cloud and just use the image that's been pre-built and tested. Uh, or you have that option to go use Image Builder and customize it to your heart's content, get it the way you like it, and then ship that off uh, to the cloud as well. The difference really with, with server uh, is really that we try to shrink down that package set as much as possible. And then also within cloud, you don't have any type of like kickstart based provisioning or provisioning from an ISO or anything like that. You're just going to stamp out the same image every time. So hmm. there's certain things like, uh, like cloud init that you will right. need inside a cloud image. So that way you can read that metadata coming down out of the cloud provider and set up IP addresses and, and things like that. So the Fedora Cloud Edition is basically more of an opinionated deployment of either Fedora Server or Fedora Workstation. It's, it's that opinion that comes into play. Very much so. We want, I mean, we as the, as the Fedora Cloud, uh, you know, working group, what we really want to see is that you can take this image and take it to nearly any cloud on the planet and you should be able to just boot it and it will go. You hmm. shouldn't really have to do any additional configuration or anything like that. Now, the challenging part is the image formats because Azure wants a different format than AWS, which wants a different format than DigitalOcean. And yep. Image Builder is a real helper with that because you could say, hey, I need this in a QCOW and boom, you have a QCOW. I need this in a RAW and then RAW comes out or a VHD or whatever you need. So that's mm -hmm. that's where that really comes in handy. I'm, I'm quite a fan of, of uh, Image Builder, actually part of the team that helps support it uh, for the rel side of the house. So I, I nice. love playing with Fedora's Image Builder because it's it's further upstream and you get the new shiny things quicker. Go ahead, Joseph. Sorry, I, I, I had to I had to brag on Image Builder. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it makes total sense. Um, so, so when we talk about the main differentiator between cloud and server being that cloud is is much more is basically smaller so that it can be that building block or, or an easy thing that you can uh, plug in and then build off of it, you know, whatever way you see fit. Um, why is that the thing that you're valuing in working in, in, in Fedora Cloud? Is it related to, because I know, I, I know I'm kind of speaking out of, you know, I'm not super familiar with cloud infrastructure and what have you, but I do know that it takes a certain amount of resources. Many times you're paying for how many resources you're using and it's not as simple as hardware you might own on-prem. Um, so I know there's that aspect of it. And I know also with servers in general, you want very long, like long uptime. So the smaller, presumably you make an image, the less can go wrong. I guess, it, are, is it basically all of those things that are a factor? Is there a particular one of those or something else that is making you think this is why we want a small package for cloud? Yeah, because everything in cloud is is utility priced. Now it depends on where you go. Some cloud providers will say, hey, you get this size of instance and you get um, like all these things, you know, it comes with it for this gotcha. price, like a monthly price. Then you'll go to some other ones where it's much more utility price. And it's like, okay, you gotta pick how much RAM you want and how much CPU you want and how much right. network you want. And you're gonna pay for each one of those independently. And so what we really wanna do is I don't want anybody to say, wow, like I don't wanna deploy Fedora in cloud, why? Uh, because Fedora is too big or when it boots, it's using a gig of RAM or it's taking up 20 gigs of disk space for all the packages. So if we can have Fedora come up and it's using, I don't know, under 256 megs of RAM and, and you know, uh, under two gigs of disk space, then it does two things for the person who's using it. One is they can go with a smaller instance and save money, which is, which is awesome. 
uh, or they can go with the same size instance they have before and have more disk space and more memory to expand everything that they want to deploy. So it lets them go a little bit further. So it's not, we're not all looking about shrinking things too. We also want it to be more cloud integrated. So like, for example, when you get Fedora server, you have uh, the firmware update manager, so you can update your server's firmware underneath. You also have IPMI tools. So you can manage the IPMI, uh, you know, like the out-of-band management that's in the server. Mm -hmm. We want the same thing for cloud. And so that's why we package up uh, like AWS CLI, uh, Azure CLI, uh, some other cloud provider CLIs as well, because then from inside that instance, you can actually administer your cloud deployment. So for example, at AWS, you can, um, you can create a, an access policy that says, hey, mm -hmm. this instance can put data in Amazon S3, you know, object storage. Uh, and then you don't have to give it any credentials. You assign the policy to the instance. Uh, and then you say, hey, I need to drop all files in S3. It does a quick check to see what instance role your instance has. And then boom, you're dropping files off in S3 and no one gave you a password or an API key or anything. So those integrations are really what we're trying to, to build out as well. So when you do that deployment, stuff in the cloud just works. You don't have to go and find software in other places. So I imagine if um, if Fedora Cloud is designed to be very streamlined and very, uh, very compact, uh, I imagine that there's some kind of intelligence in the installer, the deployment mechanism that... Uh, that says, oh, I'm running on top of AWS or a, I'm running on top of Azure. So instead of instead of deploying on Azure, you get all the all the tools. You get Azure, AWS, CLI, and GCP's uh, G Cloud tool. There's there's some sort of intelligence that says, oh, I'm running on top of AWS. So at the moment, uh, we do that via Image Builder. So in, Image Builder knows what the base requirements are. For example, um, Azure has an agent. Uh, that can run inside the instance, but it doesn't make sense to put that agent outside of Azure. And mm -hmm. so it only starts up if you're running inside of Azure. Um, most other things, like as far as cloud in it goes, like the initial metadata and, and the installation, or um, you know, the initial configuration, that's pretty standard across almost all cloud providers. Cloud in it has kind of leveled the playing right. field uh, among all of them. But what we really like to get to is start putting some of these tools on the right images from the start. Um, so for example, um, another AWS feature, we're trying to put a tool in there so that you can easily mount uh, the Elastic File Store hmm. uh, without having to know all the NFS insanity. <laughs> uh, you would just basically, the command that it shows in the AWS console, you would just copy, paste it in Fedora and go. So mm -hmm. you don't have to do the, the NFS4 dance and try and figure out. <laughs> Uh, what's happening there. There's a watchdog that's included and some other stuff. So if the mount goes down, it could take certain actions. So. so we had a question in chat. Um, basically, where can I get Fedora Cloud? Yeah. So the easiest way is to, if you go to getfedora.org, which I think is, is that getfedora.org? I always forget I the URL. I think it uh, should still, still work. I think it yeah, that's the new site. That's always been the one I've always gone to. So if you go to getfedora.org, there is an option on there uh, in the second row for Fedora Cloud. And so if you click on the download, download now link there, you'll have some options. Uh, of course, some of these options are, I want to download that image and then upload it uh, to a cloud and import it. Uh, and then with AWS, you can actually click on the little table and it'll pop up a screen that lets you just click and directly launch. So if you're already logged into the EC2 console, you can just launch it. We're working to expand that into Azure now. Uh, we've got a few mm -hmm. challenges with the way we generate the Azure image files that we've still got to work out. Um, and then eventually we'd like to get that for some other providers too. Awesome. <clears throat> and then Image Builder is also an option. So you can, you can install Image Builder on a Fedora machine that you have laying around and, um, and build straight from there. I sense another. Uh, I sense another episode being added to our backlog right now. <laughs> Fedora, uh, the the image builder tool is amazing. I I cannot say enough good things about it. <clears throat> and you can run it in a container as well, which is which means you can run it in GitHub Actions. So, if you want to have Fedora images that are uploaded uh, frequently via GitHub Actions, you can do that as well. Ooh, yeah. That way, your image is always up to date. I like this right. idea. Yeah, I feel I like have to I, I forget home where, strategy. But... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Joseph. Sorry. No, yeah, I just I I 
I forget where it is that I heard that, but I did hear. I, I've heard Image Builder already something like it, which is probably the same thing, come up in a few different Fedora discussions. So I feel like it may come up more often. It might even be tied to one of the initiatives, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head. So that'll be exciting. <laughs> Um, another question came in over chat here. Uh, is it possible to deploy Fedora Cloud via Terraform? Or is it available in any of the cloud marketplaces? So yes, uh, in AWS right now, it gets automatically uploaded uh, and it's in the interface. So actually every night, uh, there's nightly images uploaded for every stable release. And then Rawhide gets new images uploaded every night. So if you wanna live on the edge, uh, and get the absolute latest code. It's dropped there nightly, and you can launch those. So the best way to do it with Terraform, I don't have any code handy, uh, but I know there there's some demos on their site or some uh, explanations there where you basically need to match uh, a string, like Fedora Cloud Base, and then the version number that you want, tell Terraform to grab you the latest one, and you'll be good to go. Or you can just get the AMI in AWS and just hard code it, uh, and then change it when the when a new release comes out. Uh, on other clouds, for example, um, DigitalOcean and Vulture and Hetzner, I know for sure. And I haven't checked Linode in a while, but I believe they have it as well. Uh, they have their own Fedora builds uh, that they've done. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to use those. You can still upload your own, uh, create one with Image Builder or download one from the site and upload it yourself. Uh, but there, various other providers have, have built their own Fedora images. They may not match the experience that you get with Fedora Cloud, like sometimes they'll use the root user as the default, whereas we prefer to mm -hmm. use Fedora as the default. Yes, sir. So let's let's talk a little bit about history here. How did how did the Cloud Edition come to be? Where what was the what was kind of the triggering event that says we need to focus on this? That's a good question because it was a little bit before I got involved with the Cloud effort. Uh, but I think where a lot of this stems from is I think it's people working on Red Hat Enterprise Linux sit down and they say, hey, we need to we need to experiment like we need to work with the community. We need to just figure this out. Like, what does this look like? And so I think, um, uh, you know, really trying to figure out, like, what does this cloud edition mean? Like some of the same stuff we talked about before. Is it just server or is it server minus something or is it server minus something? But we add something else. Um, and I think that's really the question that it comes down to, because if you really think about it, when you're building a container image, you're you're like, man, how small can I go? Uh, but then when it comes to cloud, you're like, okay, well, I got to put a kernel in there and I got to put some <laughs> system management utilities and then cloud knit, which requires Python. So it's going to get a little bit larger. Um, but honestly, I don't, I don't really know how it got started, but that would be my best guess based on what I've seen so far. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So it wasn't because I know sometimes there'll be initiatives that maybe start in Fedora that were just kind of organic from within the community, then later on, Red Hat decides to take that and, and, and run with it. But in this case, it seems like this is Red Hat having an idea and then thinking the best place to work this out is in Fedora and in that context, and then see see what comes out of it. Um, and I think that's, appreciate. <laughs> that's the great thing about Fedora is that sometimes we'll, we'll hit a problem or a customer will ask us for something and we sit there and we think, that's a really good idea. You know, we haven't thought about it from that perspective before. And we thought, well, let's take it to the community and see if maybe other people have run into this, uh, how they're solving it. And maybe we can solve it in a better way together. Um, and sometimes that works super well. And sometimes it creates arguments, uh, mm -hmm. but, but it usually works out pretty well. And it's, it's really exciting to see initiatives like, uh, like the cloud cloud edition, things like uh, the shift to Podman, things like that, that, uh, can either start from the enterprise side of the house and work and and the enterprise side circles around upstream and says, hey, Fedora community, let's we want to try this out. Let's let's test it out. Let's see what happens. Let's try it. Or sometimes things come in at the community and then the enterprise side is like, ooh, yeah, that may work for, for, for Fedora Workstation, but I could see a real use for that in like VDI desktops or something. And and then adopting it, putting resources behind it to help make that make sure that initiative is successful. And at cloud providers too, sometimes they show up and, and say, "Hey, wait a minute! Like we've got a mutual customer, or mm -hmm. we've seen this done somewhere else. Can can y'all do the same thing?" Um, and then we'll have a conversation with that as well. I mean, we love it when the providers jump into the Fedora Cloud Sig, and we've got a few in there as well. Uh, David that runs the Sig uh, works for AWS. 
And so he brings in a whole lot of, of knowledge and experience from his side of like, hey, let's do this, but let's avoid that, that kind of thing. So it's very helpful. I actually have a, uh, it's a small question, but I, I wonder. So I know that um, Amazon Linux, Amazon Linux, uh, since I think Amazon Linux 2022 and then 2023, that's based on Fedora. But I know it, it's very much like based on Fedora, but then they, they change a whole lot. So this is not, uh, you know, just a simple... You know, let's let's change a few things here and there, and then call it a day. I know that that, that more goes into it. Uh, do you happen to know if if a lot of what's happening in Fedora Cloud also goes into Amazon Linux, or maybe you don't? That's just fine. But I was just curious um, if there was any collaboration there for for Amazon Linux. Yeah, so we uh, we do have a call uh, between uh, some folks that work on Fedora and some folks at AWS, and we talk about challenges. Uh, we talk about things that, that they want to see or questions that they have. Um, and they're working to make sure that some of their improvements uh, land back into Fedora. And so I think it's beneficial for both. And we've had some conversations back and forth about, you know, how best to do documentation. Could we improve the way we handle CVEs, like critical security problems and things like that. Um, and then also some of the things that make... Um, you know, Amazon Linux really good at Amazon is that they've integrated a lot of things uh, that work really well with their cloud. And so we said, well, hey, why don't we bring some of those integrations directly in Fedora um, and get iterating there and let everybody benefit from it and then get some of the other cloud providers to bring in uh, their bits as well? Because I think that's the key part is that if you can get if you can make Fedora a really good cloud citizen, you know, mm -hmm. where it's really well integrated and it plays well with the cloud, then I think that's a huge win. You love to see it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's awesome. Um, so I did have another question, which is, uh, it, this is kind of what partly threw me off. So I, I knew for the longest time, all right, Fedora Cloud is there and it's right next to Fedora server. So I'm like, I, I guess they're related. But then I'm looking at the flock and I'm looking at the, the programs coming up and I see Cloud and KDE. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? KDE in... In, in like fluffy Fedora server. Like I don't understand, you're breaking my mind here. Um, and so I go, I, I look into it, watch the talk. Uh, and I obviously learn a lot about the collaboration between cloud and KDE and virtual desktops becomes uh, the theme of that talk. Um, so I guess for maybe to start off on that line of thinking, is that is that just one of many use cases I imagine when it comes to like, like deploying virtual desktops and in this case that being available now, with KDE, that's just one of the things that you would be able to use Fedora Cloud for. I mean, I know the answer is yes, but I imagine it's not that much of a focus. It's just like a cool new thing you guys can do. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you definitely could uh, have a workstation in cloud. And then with a lot of the, um, like some of the recent cloud instances that actually have GPUs attached to them, if you do any kind of like CAD work or Blender or, or stuff like that, where you need like really powerful CPU and GPU to crunch you know, lots of numbers and things like that and, and generate all these images. Um, it can be really awesome to put this in cloud because then the great thing is, is like you can have this instance uh, like you may need a machine that costs $20,000 to do this work and you need wow. it sitting next to you and making your office really hot. Um, and you'll make your family members really angry that you spent $20,000. as well. <laughs> but you may be able to run over to a cloud and say, Hey, wait a minute. I only need this thing for about six hours a day, like I, six to eight hours a day. And per hour, it's 10 cents an hour or I don't know, 50 cents an hour or a dollar an hour. Oh, wow. And you sit there and you think, well, wait a minute, let me do the math. That's not that bad. Like if I'm only going to use it eight hours a day, five days a week, maybe instead I just rent that VM. Uh, and then I keep the storage hot in the cloud. You know, I don't destroy my storage. And then when I come back in on Tuesday morning, I fire up a new instance, attach my storage, and then boom, I'm back to you know whatever work that I was doing. So that that's one aspect of it. Um, but I think another aspect of it too is just sometimes it's really nice to have a desktop in the cloud. Uh, if you're on someone else's machine and you're like, oh no, I need my tools or I need this app that I use all the time or I've got my password manager, so I don't know, whatever. Maybe it happens to, uh, to be that you just really love that environment. Then you can connect to it from anywhere uh, and you don't have to have that locally. And you can start doing work um, you know, on an iPad or an Android tablet or something and connect to that instance and do your work with, with a very small machine right next to you. So that's not something that the Fedora Cloud Edition is, it's not something we're directly working on putting in the edition, but it's really exciting to see 
uh, other groups say, hey, wait a minute, like what if we did this in cloud? Like what value would we get from it? And I would say on the on the Red Hat side, there there's some things being done there as well to really help people that do um, like animation, uh, animation studios, because uh, they have the same problem yep. with workers working from home. You don't want to put a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar machine under their desk, but you can go in the cloud and say, how much is it per day per worker to, you know, have them have a place to work, you know, with with really good equipment on the on the backside. Yeah, that's a really good point. I remember I forget when it was, but it was a little while back where I was reading a report <laughs> on um, the enterprise Linux ecosystems remaining the preferred platform for a certain animation work. So like the stuff like when you think of like. Pixar illumination, like these these folks are are using Enterprise Linux, which is its own cool thing, and and maybe we'll be able to talk about that a little more in depth. Uh, well, not even time. just Enterprise Linux, but uh, RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, is the preferred platform for is part of the reference architecture for the VFX uh, Alliance, I think is what it's called. Mm, but it's basically I think I, yeah, it's probably exactly what I read. an indus industry standards group, and uh, that that announcement came out about a year, year and a half ago or so, right around, not too long after RHEL 9 was launched and RHEL uh, introduced RHEL workstations as part of an AWS offering. Uh, sorry, but I also work on the RHEL, RHEL for workstations uh, marketing pods. So, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, most of that work comes from Fedora. I mean, if, if it wasn't for Fedora's work with the GNOME project and working on, or in this case, KDE, um, and both GNOME and KDE working together to improve desktop tools, we wouldn't be able to do something like that with Ralph. <clears throat> and and I'm, I'm back in the day, I used to do this with with Tiger VNC and you know mm -hmm. remote servers. And the screen was so slow to refresh. And then someone showed oh, me recently, <laughs> someone did a demo for me recently of like the well uh, Rel workstation. I think Amazon has their own client. It's not VNC uh, related. E it's its e own. ECV. No, Ni nice DCV. So, yeah. And when I saw the demo, I w it was literally like they were working on a machine that was sitting in the next room. I was yep. impressed. And it was halfway across the country. So I don't know. Technology's come a long way on remote desktop. Yeah. yeah. We, we, uh, I, I host a, a, a show on on the REL YouTube channel called uh, REL Presents. And we had, uh, we had an episode about REL for workstations in AWS. And our guest was literally making changes using open source tools. Like I think, I think he was using blender and was, uh, had, had a, had basically a room and was changing the lighting effects. And even, even through the lag of the live stream, you could tell that his experience was so smooth. I, I couldn't imagine. I mean, what I do is type in a terminal and if there's lag on that then you're like there's there's a major internet problem <laughs> but to be able to do something as critical as changing like the pixel size or changing the angle of a lighting source i mean that's that's intensive work and the 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 low latency of that connection is just unbelievable yeah that's great to hear because i don't for work uh, the reason it piqued my interest is because i've seen this in a few different places where i've worked where obviously i'm on you know we think of a company there's the it department and then there's the guy who makes the tickets and i'm the guy who makes the tickets <laughs> of like something went wrong what's happening here you know what have you uh but i i've had to work in, in almost every place that i've been in some some form of, of remote desktop uh, which i understand for various like security reasons and implementation reasons and what have you um and they've always not been like the best experience and there's also been windows environments so that's why it was oh, personally exciting to me is <laughs> yeah but uh thinking about like virtual desktops and then thinking about that, that you can get good performance on them for the end user um I mean, even now among my my coworkers, it's a common complaint that we long so desperately to work locally because our, our virtual desktop is it, it's fine but you feel it and it doesn't make for a good experience mm -hmm. so that's why that piqued my interest i'm happy for it and that is definitely when the year of the linux desktop happens that's a category that i am also still watching for is, is that <laughs> still know. a thing That'll be, i had to it's a meme oh, it's a meme man. i had to the year of the remote linux desktop <laughs> there that's you go that, uh, that could be it <laughs> So, got a couple more questions for you, and and if you're if you're following along with us, feel free to uh, to put your questions into chat. We'll try and try our best to cover those live. Uh, but uh, so, what are the future plans? What's what's coming? What's new? What's exciting? Uh, 
either either what what do you see or what are what are some of the goals for the fedora cloud edition so i think there's a few like first is really uh getting more of those integrations so having it so that um you know fedora is better integrated into these clouds so that there's no there's no features that you can't take advantage of you know i want you um you know within the group it's like hey if you deploy on on cloud y or cloud z you should be able to consume all of their services, like their biggest, most popular services as easily as possible. And if there's anything missing from Fedora, like if it's a configuration or if it's a package or if it's something like that, we want to say, hey, what is that? And how do we make it better? And then how does it change the user experience? Um, and then, of course, document it so people know how to use it. Um, I think the second part is really trying to understand how do we expand into more clouds with an image that was built by the Fedora community? So like mm -hmm. I said before, there are some of these clouds where we're not there right now. So like Azure and, and Google is one of them. Now, of course, with Image Builder and downloading the image and uploading it yourself, you're there in 10, 20 minutes tops. Uh, but we really want to get into those clouds. And then some of these other clouds where they build their own image, we'd really like to work with them to say, hey, how do we provide you an image that meets all your requirements, uh, but yet still matches you know, all the standard things that people are going to expect to find? Uh, in Fedora. So that's another part. And then kind of the really forward looking stuff is, is someone asked recently, if you haven't looked at CoreOS, uh, mm. someone said, well, why do we have cloud and CoreOS? And then some of us kind of stood back and scratched our heads for a bit. Um, and so maybe there's an avenue there. Uh, maybe the maybe the cloud edition transforms into being more like CoreOS. Maybe CoreOS becomes a cloud edition. I really don't know. Uh, but we're in some just initial discussions around that just to see like what this even means. So well, and to and to break off your thought for just a second, uh, for those of you that don't know, CoreOS is based on RPM OS tree, which basically, if if that's a new concept, think of it like uh, like your phone, where you're running you're running your mobile device, you've you you've got your operating system, you've got your apps, you've got your user data, and then um, from there you download the next version and your your device reboots into that new version. Think of think of that same concept at the server level. Um, well, I guess not even server level. I I know of some organizations that are using uh, RPM OS tree based builds for desktops. Um, so that that makes a lot of sense because your workloads continue to function, continue to function, and continue to function until that update is ready. Uh, you you hear this talked about a lot in terms of cloud deployments or edge. Uh, where your where your device may not have the best internet pipe that that it can have, and so by downloading that update and not booting into it until that update is ready to be employed, uh, that that's kind of the, some of the advantages. There, it's far more far more involved than that, but at, at a basic level, that's the difference between a is it transit transactional. Is that <laughs> anyway? That's the like difference that. between that's between the difference between an RPM based distribution that's managed by something like DNF and uh, RPM OS tree. So sorry, I wanted to. I, I'm, I'm trying oh, to yeah. be cognizant of the fact that th this kind of got enterprisey real quick. But we have people from all over the community, and some folks are just interested in, in trying out all the different desktop environments. So. Um, if, if you join us in the chat or in the comments, uh, feel free to let us know if, if there's ever a term that you don't acknowledge. Uh, I want this to be uh, to be helpful. Um, so sorry, Major, didn't, didn't mean oh, to cut you okay. off. But, yeah, uh, I know. And I think the greatest part about the Fedora CoreOS experience, and, and I use it myself to run quite a bit of container infrastructure, is that, that it does exactly that. It gets you from zero to containers really fast. Uh, so if you just say, hey, I have these three containers or I've got WordPress, MySQL, and a load balancer I need to deploy, you're, you're there fast. Like there's no OS configuration or installing mm -hmm. packages or whatever. Load the containers up and go. Uh, the other nice thing too is that that update mechanism, you can configure it to your heart's content. When it runs, how it runs, what it does after it runs. And so for me, I know that every two weeks on Friday in the morning, uh, my machine is going to update and get the mm -hmm. newest update, which means it's going to reboot. I'm going to get an alarm from my monitoring and then the alarm clears and I'm like, all right, good. Back to work. Uh, so you don't really have to think about that. The other nice thing is too, is that uh, if at any point you have a bug, you can tell someone exactly where your system is. You can give them yep. the exact state of the system. They can bring up a system that's identical and reproduce your bug. So it's not like I have these packages installed with this weird config in the corner. It's like, <laughs> no, this is what my system looks like. For sure. Um, and then 
that that kind of ties into our last question for you, uh, and at least our, our last documented question. Um, I'll see if Joseph has some curveballs for you. But uh, you're, you're talking about trying to get Fedora uh, Cloud into more clouds. Uh, and so I, I get asked the question frequently, uh, how can I contribute? So if, if someone is really excited about this, they heard this episode and they are in love with what you're doing now, how can they get involved? So I think the, the best way is to join uh, our Matrix chat. So on the Fedora Matrix server, it's the room is just called Cloud. Um, and then hopefully if, if the Libera chat gets, uh, or Li Libera, Lib Libera, Lib I don't know how oh, to pronounce it. If it gets that connected works. back again to Matrix, I'll be very happy. Uh, but we have uh, Pound Fedora Dash Cloud uh, in there as well. And that's the best way to get in touch with us. Uh, we also have a, a repo in Pagger uh, that's Cloud Dash SIG, and you can open issues or ask a question. Uh, but really, honestly, if you want to get involved, one of the easiest ways is to uh, is to just reach out to some of these cloud providers and just say, hey, like what, what would it take for us to have this image in there? Or what are your requirements? Or how can we supply this? So if you if you work for one of these providers or if you know somebody who works for one of these providers, um, a lot of what we do is word of mouth. Hey, do you know someone who works there? Oh, you know her? Okay, cool. Let me connect you with her. Yeah, okay. You know him over at that place? Okay. Like, let's start talking. Uh, and then once we start opening the doors, usually people are like, oh, yeah, we don't want to build these images anymore. Can y'all build these images? <laughs> That's usually how the conversation goes. Um, and then also just more use cases. Um, so like I said before, you know, the big two use cases are like I, I have a pet and I, and I treat it like, you know, uh, like it has to be there every day. And then more like the cattle aspect where it's like I have a lot of these. And if I lose some, I'm going to be upset, but I'll just replace them immediately. Uh, just better understanding these use cases of what people are trying to do. Some of the workstation stuff is interesting. Um, and then trying to understand like what clouds, like which clouds would be more interesting for Fedora to be in or integrations maybe that we're missing between those clouds. Uh, but we always have plenty of little uh, easy bugs. Well, sometimes easy bugs uh, to work on with certain cloud providers. So if you, if there's a bug in Linode and you're like, oh, I'm in Linode all the time, I can go fix that bug. We would love to have you. Because uh, keeping track of all the different cloud providers and testing infrastructure in each one can sometimes get a little bit challenging. Uh, there was a question that I had, uh, or, or I, I asked about it, um, surrounding documentation. Um, I, is that, uh, from what I saw, it seemed like that was an area, like a goal to, to develop a little bit more. Um, is there any kind of like structure or initiative that someone uh, interested in contributing should plug into on your end? Or is it more just, hey, if you're interested in documentation in general, just get in touch and either we'll give you direction or just just document what you're familiar with. Uh, what direction would you give for someone who wanted to contribute that way? More the latter. We're, we're pretty informal uh, so far, but we really do want to have um, some things that better answer some of these questions. Like some of the questions that have popped up here, like where can I get mm -hmm. Fedora and where, you know, okay, I can't, I, Fedora doesn't exist at my cloud. How do I put it there? Um, you know, having this kind of documentation available all in one place. Um, I love the Fedora Core OS documentation for this aspect because they have all these things where they're like, hey, do you want to configure this? Here's exactly what you need. You want to do this? Here's exactly what you need. And I would love mm -hmm. for us to get the same thing uh, for cloud. So uh, if people feel like they have some knowledge on how to deploy an image in their favorite cloud or in various clouds, uh, we would gladly welcome the help. But we don't have anything terribly structured uh, so far. So if you're okay with working with some unstructured stuff and trying to figure out where to put things like th this is the place to go. <laughs> no, that, that's an opera. That's a leadership opportunity is what that is. <laughs> there you go. You come there in, you go. Perfect. And now you own it and then you can, you can do what you got to do. That's how it is. Either it's either there's structure, a general Fedora pro tip, either there's structure or there's not. And if there's no structure, guess who gets to make the structure? You do. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's... So, I also mentioned that just, I guess, Fedora broadly, but don't be spooked if you see that. You know, that's an opportunity for you if you have the initiative to to take it and, and, and run with it and, and that be a big value add on your part. Yeah. Well, and, and, and we have embrace, meetings. Oh, go ahead. Embrace the uncomfortableness because when, when I started asking around like February, March about, uh, about bringing the Fedora podcast back, it, it was it was kind of uncomfortable because it's like yeah if you want to do it it's like yeah but shouldn't there be rules meetings processes is there something I need to is there some, just do I need to fill out something they're like no just go for it 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, I'm still really not is. sure if I'm doing this right, but we're we're yeah, just going to keep plowing ahead. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's how I, I mentioned that because there may be some folks turn up and they hear crickets, you know, they're like, I don't they didn't get a response. Or they don't know what to do. So sometimes it's about exploring because maybe the people you're looking for aren't the spots that, that you check. But sometimes there isn't something going on there. And I really do think, hey, that's. Uh, an opportunity, a chance for you to do something and, and you to develop the structure to get it going. So, yeah, I, yeah, that's how it is for, for a few corners of the project. And, uh, you know, bring, you know, if someone with gumption, go for it. We're happy to support you. <laughs> well, uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour. So closing thoughts, Joseph, you want to, you want to kick us off with uh, just, we'll go around the horn real quick and, and close this up. Uh, sure. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it, uh, Nature. I think it was um, a really good insight into uh, like Fedora Cloud and how that specifically fits in, um, especially when it gets around like as the marketing guy again, right? Like having good messaging for the use case of each edition. I have a much better idea now to, to be able to speak to that. Um, I also wanted to do, I don't know if you would have said this already, but I did want to make sure it came up is um, if you could mention your, your Mastodon handle. Because I hmm. think that's a great resource. I'm looking. I, I, I. It doesn't make sense to me, but I know that it's valuable. So uh, I do try to, you know, boost that one when, when, when I see it. Um, and I do want anyone who's interested in Fedora Cloud follow Major on Mastodon because he's, he's giving updates regularly there. Um, is is it at Major? I don't know if it's on Fostodon, but what's your hand? Yeah, on? yeah. It's just uh, Major on Fostodon. Or Fostodon dot org. Cool. So yeah, that's, that's it for me. Just thanks. <laughs> Major, any any closing thoughts? Yeah, no, first off, thank y'all for having me. This has been uh, really fun. And yeah, I think the uh, the biggest takeaway I would say is that, uh, you know, uh, a cloud is, is not a panacea, but it certainly is fun. And it's it's fun to be able to deploy something and tear it down, deploy something else and change it up. And, you know, if you make a mistake, okay, cool. Hit the delete button and go try again. Um so if, if you're of that mindset um, and you're really interested in experimenting and kind of stepping into the unknown and, and taking on some of these leadership opportunities, as, as you said, Joseph, um, <laughs> it, it, we'd love to have you. So um, and then also, too, you know, if uh, uh, if you're familiar with a certain cloud provider and you really love using Fedora there and you're like, man, I wish it had this or it didn't have this, you know, come on by and talk about it. Uh, you don't need to open an issue or anything. Just jump into the chat or come to our uh meetings uh every thursday hmm. awesome um so uh joseph do you want to uh you want to tease out our next episode oh sure okay so the next episode i think is definitely one that i'll be able to speak to a little bit better um <laughs> uh, we should actually be having on <coughs> mark pearson from lenovo um, so that'll be very exciting. Um, they did. We're very grateful to Lenovo uh, specifically because they were one of our sponsors for Flock. So that helped a ton and um, they're going to enable things not just a Flock, but maybe other things in the future. Uh, and the marketing team has been working closely with them on, on trying to uh, make some progress when it comes to shipping Fedora. It's also tied to an initiative, lots of cool, fun stuff there. So, and I'll be there too. So, but actually, I can speak to some of the work there because that has. There has actually been collaboration between um, myself and Lenovo, so it's very exciting. And if you're interested in Lenovo and Fedora on Lenovo and buying Fedora from Lenovo, come check out the next uh, podcast episode. Yep, we will be live in two weeks on the same channel. Uh, bear with us uh, now. Now that uh, now that summer break is kind of wrapping up, I'm back to looking at uh, where else does this podcast need to be. We've got the YouTube version and the audio podcast, but uh, we're eventually hoping to include some uh, some demos and some hands on type materials as well. Um, so definitely want to try and get this out there more places. So if you want to help with that, feel free to drop into the podcast uh, matrix room. Um, definitely join the uh, the Fedora uh, Matrix space. There are rooms for just about everything. Some of them are geo based. Some of them are project based. Others are just kind of Fedora social hangouts. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, but uh, there's there's one for the Fedora podcast as well. Jump in there. I could use all the help I can get. Uh, Joseph, thank you so much for jumping in as, as co-host again. Really appreciate your your uh, your uh, your thoughts, your questions, your opinions. Really, uh, really made made this episode what it was. Major, thank you for jumping in. You kind of got voluntold to do this episode. It, it kind of feels like so. <laughs> thank you for thank you no, for joining us. And, uh, <laughs> Happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, this was great. And I think I signed up for only two new uh, topics today. So we're 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 doing okay. <laughs> uh, so so actually was asked to do an episode about F Fedora Co Core OS. And then when I do the show notes, I'll look at the other one that I already volunteered myself to do. So um, if you would like to be a guest on the show, again, reach out to me. Uh, I'm easy to find anywhere IT guy, Eric, uh, as well as in the podcast matrix room. Uh, we've got tons of episodes, but in, in the works. But we need uh, people to talk to uh, talk to them. So um, I, I tend to learn about as much as all of you when when uh, when I go to prep for one of these episodes. The only difference is I get to do mine before we're live. So I, I do my prep and my research beforehand. That's the only difference. <laughs> but. On behalf of my co-host, Joseph, and my guest today, Major, and uh, on behalf of the entire Fedora Linux community, thank you all for joining us so much. Make sure to subscribe to get uh, notified anytime we go live or anytime we publish a new episode. And until then, we will see you again in two weeks. Thank you all. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>